you were talking about the bodybuilder or the person who was looking to grow muscle. We were talking about uh, maximal versus optimal. You said, you know, optimal would be more of a whole food uh, approach as opposed to protein isolates, which are, you know, entering the blood very rapidly and then going down. You were about to to talk to endurance athletes. Is it is it the same for an endurance athlete who has slightly different goals to the person that's in the gym trying to build muscle? Yeah. So sometimes, you know, I guess you were talking about opinions and what what I'm known for. When I'm talk, you know, I'm a huge advocate for food first approaches, um, and that's you know trying to use incorporate you know whole foods as much as possible into an anabolic eating regimen. But that doesn't mean food only, okay? Food first, but sometimes supplements are just necessary. And endurance athletes are different, yeah, you know, different type of exercise, of course. But it, metabolically, it's also different. So when we run or ride a bike, depending on the duration and intensity, um, most people would view protein oxidation as quite trivial right? That's, you know, you're constantly thinking about carbohydrate oxidation and lipid oxidation. And that's sort of the notion. This is sort of what Don has advocated for. He's always like, well, you can say you have a protein requirement, but really you have an amino acid requirement. Okay. So that's very true when you're thinking about exercise metabolism or exercise amino acid metabolism. So if you view protein on a whole, not very interesting, but if you zoom in to certain amino acids, it's a little more exciting. Okay. You know, you, you talked about alanine. So with increasing exercise intensity, you're going to get in, increased release of alanine from the muscle. It's a good gluconeogenic precursor. You're also going to see a large increase in leucine oxidation. Okay. And, and so when you're running, you're oxidizing leucine and, you know, just put this in perspective, let's say you go for a 60, minute run or a one hour run at about 70% of your view to peak, which most of us, you know, a decent person could do. I probably couldn't, I haven't ran for a while, but most individuals can hold about 65 to 70% of their view to peak. Okay. So during that little hour run, you probably burn anywhere between two to three grams of leucine. Okay. So what do you do after the bout? You eat protein and to put that in perspective, I guess, how much leucine is in about 20 grams of whey protein? About three grams of leucine. All right. So guess what you need to do? So when you eat protein, you eat it, you have to replace that leucine amino acid oxidative loss, right? That's a necessity, but you also need to give enough substrate to help your muscles remodel. So endurance athletes are sort of fighting two battles. They're fighting the fact I need food substrate to, or amino acid substrate to help recover that leucine. And I also need to provide enough to make sure we're getting optimal remodeling. So the problem is they also need to make sure they're eating enough carbohydrate, right? Protein is important, but so is carbohydrate because they need to make sure, you know, the glycogens, they're taking a gas. And so stuff I've been working on with Dan Moore, again, uh, an individual up in Toronto, a good friend of mine, also a a great, very clever protein nutrition researcher, just like Stu. Um, we've been trying to understand how to re-optimize recover Lucy net balance during recovery from endurance exercise. So this is where I think an isolated protein powder might be particularly important. So you got an endurance athlete who can eat a whey carbohydrate blend, isolated blend, facilitate that rapid release, get that leucine in the circulation in a rapid manner, help recover that amino acid oxidative loss, and then, you know, transition to that food first approach where, you know, they eat a proper mixed meal, right? So a great example where, yeah, it is a food first approach, but doesn't mean food only. Um, and here's a situation where I think way isolated food, it could be, what it could be a plant-based uh, food source too, um, where I think these isolated food sources could be more useful for an athlete is in those, particularly for an endurance athlete. Is the damage, you know, damage, you, you kind of defined that earlier, uh, from endurance exercise, I'm going to assume at a 
muscle fiber level is different, looks different to the damage that we see from resistance training. Are that is that damage different? And is the total protein requirement likely the same for someone who is doing mostly resistance training versus someone who is doing a lot of endurance training? It's elevated. Endurance athletes have elevated compared to their weightlifting counterparts because of the notion I just discussed. Um, so again, this comes back to this notion that pro protein synthesis remodeling comes in various shapes and forms, right? So an endurance athlete is interested in maximizing or optimizing whatever word you want, um, depending on what you're doing, um, are interested in um, optimizing muscle protein synthesis during recovery from that endurance bout, right? Because what are they interested in doing? They need to build new capillaries. They need to build new glucose transporter, muscle glucose transporters, new fat transporters. They need to remodel those myosin heavy chains to be more fatigue resistant, right? So they're, syn they're synthesizing proteins, but it's going to be probably more non-hypertrophic remodeling all right, which is very different than a weightlifter who's trying to focus on hypertrophic remodeling. They're interested in expanding that myofibrillar pool, right? Um, where an endurance athlete um, still wants to optimize protein synthesis, but they're pursuing it through a different lens. Um, and what we found, and you know, we Dan and I ran a study. Dan Moore and I ran a study uh, probably in 2017. Actually, I was talking to somebody about this. I was like, oh, this study never got a lot of action for some reason, despite it telling us so much. But we literally gave an endurance athlete um, protein recommendations that would be fine for a weightlifter, but we could not induce, we couldn't recover net leucine balance, and we couldn't optimize the remodeling response from a protein synthetic side. Um, because we didn't give them enough. And so that's when we were really starting to think, well, we can't just give a big bolus of protein to an endurance athlete right after the bout. So we probably got to be more clever with how we prescribe protein. Again, use that isolated protein carbohydrate mixture, then transition. So more frequent feeding for them to help recover. Um, very different than a weightlifter. So I said weightlifting is fundamentally anabolic. I mean, this is this is crazy why the weightlifters are chasing um, food protein. When you think about weightlifting, what happens? Your muscle turns into a bigger amino acid sink, right? Become more sensitive to your nutrition. A trained individual has better, uh, in the fasting state, has better nitrogen retention, meaning they're better able to use the amino acids from breakdown, all right? And then what do weightlifters do? They they instead of taking advantage of that fundamental, fundamental anabolic situation, they eat a bunch of food protein and offset all that benefit. I, I'm not sure why. I think it's just that old school notion that I damage my muscles. I need more food protein to help them repair, you know, more, more is better. I mean, uh, it's just, I always get, you know, we'll talk and then what's the problem. Why, why do people intrinsically think they need so much food protein in their lives? And it's a great question. I think it's education. I mean, this is one reason why I'm talking to you, Simon, is that um, it, it's just trying to swim through the chaos of, I mean, social media or, or what have you. I think as scientists, we're doing a poor job of translating or perhaps not providing full context to what we're saying, right? Like I said, yeah, the 1.6, that's a maximal number. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but it is maximal. So I'm a big thing, you know, give the consumer the information and let them decide how they want to eat their food protein. I think the approach of many bodybuilders is like a precautionary approach. You know, if if consuming a little bit more is not going to be harmful, I, you know, I, I should err on the side of, of caution and then I at least know I'm I'm getting as much protein as my skeletal muscle requires. Well, bodybuilders are a little different. I mean, um, you know, I'm you know, they got a whole set of different rules they play by. I guess I'm talking to the general population, right? Physique athletes, bodybuilders, they need to manipulate their diet. Um, you know, food protein is satiating. Um, when you're in an energy deficit, do you want to take advantage of um, the satiating impact? You know, bodybuilders trying to eliminate carbohydrates out of their diet so they can, you know, tighten up their muscles. So, very, very different than the population I chase, right? I'm, I'm speaking to, <laughs> I'm advocating for the general population, not, not these niche 
areas. And again, um, athletes, bodybuilders, physique athletes, um, yeah, they, they need special consideration, right? I mean, everybody does, but it's, it's a little different than, I guess, the information I'm trying to convey to you right here, uh, Simon, is more aimed at most of the population, certainly not aimed at the bodybuilding community or athlete community, uh, with the exception of the endurance. If we think about the, the let's say, recreational endurance athlete, um, someone that's doing, you know, maybe they're doing 90 minutes or a couple of hours of cardiovascular training a day, so they're clocking up like, somewhere between 10 and 20 hours a week. Um, is the optimal protein intake for that person going to be around 1.6 grams per kilogram or will it look different to that? Yeah, so – it's probably closer to that. So we, I, again, I'm not, I don't think a weightlifter needs that much <laughs> food protein. I think an endurance athlete perhaps could, but it's all going to de- determine on, you know, if you do a two hour run, you're getting more amino acid oxidation waste. You need to account for that in your post-exercise recovery meal. Right. Um, and then you could split that even further, you know, and I'm not to get too deep in the weeds, um, male, males versus females. Right. I mean, females are, better fat burners compared to their male counterparts with the exception of during the luteal phase of your menstrual cycle. During that phase, you're actually a better leucine burner as a female, right? So you could argue that during, during that phase to re- completely recover that net balance, you might need a little extra food protein, right? And again, usually as a practitioner, we don't worry about that because there's not a lot of evidence there um, to support that notion. But in terms of differential nutritional recommendations based on your menstrual cycles. But, um, you know, but the other end of the continuum, there hasn't been a lot of work done in that area. So it's sort of a question mark. Um, but you know, so yeah, I would argue that endurance athletes could afford to eat closer to that 1.6, but they usually, you know, the interesting part is, is that when you look at an endurance athlete, they already have high energy availability. So their protein intakes are quite high. I guess my concern would be more about the timing of that protein intake, right? In particular, of what we just talked about, making sure that post-exercise meal is sufficient of protein followed up with that food-first approach to the next meal. But otherwise, if you would just view an, an endurance athlete, their total protein requirement is quite high because they have high energy intakes. If we're thinking about optimal recovery, so someone finishes a, a one to two hour run, they have 30 grams of an isolated protein. Would Does the proximity of the whole food meal that they're having that maybe is providing another 30 grams of protein to that matter? Is it something they should be having together or if they have it, let's say, an hour or 90 minutes later, that's okay? I know a lot of athletes are not that hungry as soon as they, they finish. Now we're getting, I mean, you know, I could speculate. I mean, I would say, um, I don't know the answer. Let's put it like that. So the best we can do is have a, uh, make a hypothesis. But if I was to design something like that, you know, from a research perspective, I would, to test that theory that I'm talking about to recover net leucine balance, as well as support, uh, protein synthesis, synthesis and subsequent remodeling response. Um, I would give that isolated mixture right after the bout and probably two to three hours later is when I would try to get them to eat again and then study to see what happens. But that's just from a practical standpoint, I think makes sense for the reason you just said, but that's pure speculation, Simon. I mean, I'm just shooting from the hip at this point. (laughs) But if you were to let to speculate based on all the research that's out there, that would be a better strategy than let's say just having 60 grams straight after you finish, which is whole food plus a shake. I mean, I would, I would do that. Yeah. I would say that's a better strategy. I don't know that, but I would think that's not a bad hypothesis.